Um, yeah, great. Um, I, so, <laughs> how do we start? Um, Hello. <laughs> Um, Good morning. This, I, I just wanted to say how this, how this whole thing came together because um, I th when my talk was accepted, I went to the OSTC website and I saw that Jordan's talk was also accepted and then he was here and um, I, um, I suggested to the NetWaste people that, hey, maybe, I mean, there's going to be a lot of duplication in our talks, I guess. Um, so there's, I'm going to talk about log management, what that stuff is, and then Jordan is going to talk about that. Maybe we should do something together. Just a short 30 minute, what is log management stuff. And so um, this is how the whole thing came together. And um, maybe we can get a special applause for Jordan because he was the one who put together most of the slides today. So maybe if we can, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Good, let's start. All right. Uh, so I guess we should introduce ourselves um, in a way. I will apologize in advance. when I, I'm, I get very nervous when I speak, and so I will speak very quickly at times. So if you cannot understand what I'm saying, please throw something at me, let me know, and I will try do my best to slow down. That's the same for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Jordan Sassel. I'm the lead developer on the Logstash project. Uh, we'll be talking about that after this talk. Um, and Logstash has been around for about four and a half years, uh, pretty much the same time as, as Greylog2 has. Um, they both, have, both projects have similar heritage in terms of sol solving log management problems. Uh, what else can I tell you? I work for uh, the Elasticsearch company uh, full-time on Logstash. Uh, Leonard Koopman is my name. Um, I started the uh, Greylog2 project. We found out it was like probably the same day in August 2009 or something. Um, <laughs> it was a really bad summer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, I'm going to say more about Greylog2 in, uh, in a talk, I guess at four or something today. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the idea of this talk is to sort of introduce the the ideas or, or what we're thinking about when we talk about log management uh, to sort of set the groundwork, introduce you to, to some of the concepts. And the first thing to talk about is, is what do we mean by, by a log? Um, I, I will tend to use the word log or the word event almost interchangeably. Uh, to me, they mean the same thing. So what is a log? A, a log to me is, is any piece of data with a time associated with it. This could be uh, a crash. Occurred at a, a software crash occurred at a given time. A, a flight took off at a given time. A movie was released at a certain date. All of these things are sort of some kind of data. You don't know the shape of the data. You don't know what kind of data it is. But there's a time that that event occurred at. So by way of example, does anyone recognize this? About half of you, slowly, <laughs> slowly people are waking up. Um, I'm sorry you recognize this. Uh, it's not easy to read, right? And if you do recognize it, you 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 might get pulled into to analyzing it for coworkers who are not as technical or not as, as understanding of this log format. Uh, but to continue the, the, the example is that um, this is some piece of data. What it means it is not important, but there is, a, there is a time associated with it. By way of another example, here's another example log. Uh, there's actually three events that happened here. Again, there's some data. We may not necessarily know what the data is. We may, we may not know what it means, but there's time associated with it. Except for that middle one, which is weird. It doesn't have a timestamp. This gets into things we'll talk about shortly about, you know, the complexities of log management, the, the challenges involved in taking all of your log data and trying to make sense of it. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah. Um, so, is, is, is there a next slide? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, there, there are like different kinds of logs, you could say. Um, so, there's... No, no. I it. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> It'll get there. It's like... You have what? to plug it. You have, have to, to plug, plug it, it in, back in. You know? yeah. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. There we go. That I'm going to step good. away from the laptop. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> it's dangerous. Um, so there, there are different kinds of locks, obviously. Um, there, are, for example, trace and debug locks. Um, there can be stuff like, um, well, what's a good, what's a good example for trace and debug lock, for example? 
Uh, Do you have a good one? Java exceptions. Java exceptions, um, all the kinds of stuff that your, that your processes are writing out directly. This kinds of data that you'll be using to troubleshoot and figure out exactly when something failed, why it failed, or mm -hmm. maybe why it succeeded. Uh, accounting logs, um, that could be stuff like, for example, that your Apache daemon, some, uh, some front-end web servers, some email servers writing um, just information about um, what happened at that point in time. Some user requested something with this IP address, so Apache logs, for example. Transaction logs, you want to say something? Yeah, so tra all, all of these kinds of logs are sort of very similar. They, they differ in, in terms of um, the target audience. Transaction logs are typically for software talking to other pieces of software. MySQL's uh, uh, replication logs are a good example. It's a transaction history of all of the, the, the writes that happened so that you can replicate them to another server. And then this is my favorite slide, like for any talk. Um, there are all kinds of problems that you get when you get into log management. This is, I think, there was this, this is the reason why we both started the whole things, right? This is why, um, why I started Greylock too, why you started Logstash. Like when we did that, I think it was still a nightmare to do that. And I hope we improved that a bit. Um, but there are several problems out there when it comes to, to log management. For example, that logs can be very difficult to access um, in in very Classical log management, um, that is, there's, there's this log management maturity scale um, that was set up by Raphael Marti once, and he says that the, the level of log management maturity zero is not collecting any logs at all, and one is to just write them to some flat file somewhere. And a lot of people, and I've, I've seen that um, since, I, since, I, since I work on Greylock 2, a lot of people still in the year 2014 are stuck at level one. They're still just writing the logs to some file somewhere. Then they have to log into the server, uh, and they have to get there somehow. I mean, sometimes there's just no way to SSH into that easily, to find the right, uh, to write, to, to, to find the right file and stuff like that. So that's that's where it starts already. It can be very difficult to access. So I think uh, you may have summarized the next couple of slides, but uh, in general, <laughs> there are just there's too many. The, part of the accessibility problem is that there's just too many logs. If you have only one server, you're going to have multiple applications and system processes running on that server. So it's even if you can access your one server, how many of you only have one server running your business? No one, right? So. Th so the distributed problem is, is, is already there. And even if you're just on one server, you're going to have you know, 15, 20, maybe even 100 processes all logging in different formats, all logging in different locations on disk in different ways. So I guess that's probably the same. That's too many servers. This is, by the way, why I once started Greylock 2. That was in the job where I was working at that point in time. We were just adding more and more servers, and we had to log in there and find the right server to log in first, and then find the right files. So that's, I think, one of the most obvious questions when it comes to log centralization as a part of log management. And my favorite, no permissions or wrong permissions. Um, uh, somebody started this daemon is root, and then you get in there as the application management user, and you can't read it or you can't write it. Um, so um, you really want to send that somewhere centrally where you don't really have to care about the actual permissions in the beginning until you start setting up something like ACLs there. This is also relevant for other teams that are non-technical teams. Your business teams or your marketing teams will want to do analysis on data that's in your logs, but they don't have SSH access. They don't have the technical knowledge to get onto the servers. You're not going to give them access because they don't know how to do what they need to do. And so it's a big permissions problem. Um, and of course, the logs can be very difficult to consume. Um, they can be unstructured. This is where Logstash comes in, luckily. Um, you have this big file of unstructured log data, and you can log stash to easily parse that, to filter that, to make some sense out of the data and, somewhere, and, and, and send that to some, some other system. Um, it requires expertise because, I mean, if you remember this, this MySQL log that Jordan showed, you have to know what that actually is. This, it's like you have to know what information that actually is, and then you also uh, need some expertise to, 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 to go through there. And if you're a not very technical user, like for example, you're a product manager or something, and you want to see, uh, see flight bookings or, or hotel bookings on your platform that went wrong, 
um, you don't want to learn like Unix tools to grab through some log file and, and SSH into stuff. Um, so it also requires expertise to actually get information out there. And what you actually want is, I think, is like a search field where you can search or, or something predefined or reports or something that, that gives you uh, direct information out of the logs without having to know how to use grab, for example. And it re requires maintenance, right? Um, one of the one of the jokes I always tell about log management is that uh, the the time you are going to fill up disk is going to be when you're sleeping at 3 a.m. You get it, your phone goes off because you're on call. Disks are full. Why are disks full? Because the logs have filled up disk because someone forgot to turn on log rotation. <laughs> and then you delete all the logs, and then the next day you're upset because now you can't debug anything, right? So it, there, there's some kind of of maintenance required. Part of that maintenance is just setting up configuration, right? Configuring your, your, your log rotation pro practices or, or even telling the, the software or the hardware that you're configuring where to write the logs to. Like, that's a setup cost. And I think part of that also is log retention. So that's something that we are dealing with a lot because that's what the systems we wrote and we are maintaining um, are taking care about is, um, for example, I think part of that is, uh, can be log rotation. Um, but that is not always so easy. So log rotation will just, you can configure it to throw away old logs at some point in time. Um, but then again, you have to configure this. Um, and also, maybe you, wanna, you, want to, you want to keep different data for a different amount of time. So maybe you have something that you need to keep for half a year for some compliance. Uh, we've been working with banks, for example. They have like the craziest log retention uh, uh, policies there that you, that you need to do somehow. And this is something that is hard to do. And also then again comes back to the problems of configuring and maintaining. If you want to do that with, with, uh, with cron jobs or something, you get into a pretty bad configuration hell really quick. Um, um, doing log retention when you are having a centralized logging system brings you other problems when it comes to performance, like deleting data in between and stuff like that. But luckily, that's something that Logstash or Greylog2 can take care of. Um, uh, but this is something, if you're, if you're using a product that does that for you, uh, because you're centralizing the logs already somewhere, um, that makes it, of course, easier. Because you, you really don't want to do that on a file base somewhere with, um, uh, with, with cron jobs or something. So obviously, uh, Leonard and myself started working on our respective projects because we felt the tooling was so bad. Uh, one, of, one of the tools you might be familiar with is simply grep, if you have Unix systems. Uh, you'll use grep, SSH, maybe some awk, maybe some sed. And, and by the time you get through writing what is probably a giant one-liner to do some kind of answer some kind of question on the command line, you're like, yes, <laughs> that one-liner is like, 500 characters long, I won't know what it does tomorrow, but look at this graph, <laughs> right? We, we talked about the expertise problem and that you know, your project managers will want to know what is the performance of the business through the logs that the business is generating. Uh, that expertise will come through you. Now you are the bad tools, right? The project <laughs> managers are coming to you to write the Perl or the Ruby or the Python or the shell to process this weird data and produce a graph that someone who is helping run the business can actually understand and interpret. And now, instead of doing your day-to-day -day job, you're on call in addition to keeping the servers maintained, but now you're also sort of this keyboard for your project manager. And you don't want to be a keyboard. You want to provide tools and things that improve access and things that improve understandability of the data. And bad tools are not helping. And this, this also brings another problem. If you run all this locally, um, there's, of course, a problem of sharing that, like sharing the knowledge how to get information out of the logs. Because um, if you have some centralized place somewhere, you can have saved searches, for example, um, some saved charts, stuff that you can easily share. Um, that is also the, the, the sharing of how to get information out of your log data is also part of this log management maturity scale. Uh, I think it's step five or something. Um, if, if you only use those tools, you have no other way than, than having like this long command lines and sharing that in a wiki somewhere or something. Yep. Um, and you have no easy way to give people access to that and to share it, to keep it updated. You run into all kinds of problems again. The life of a log. Oh, we have this nice... We have a nice graph. <laughs> so, uh, I'm still... Uh, I've been talking about logs for a number of years now, and I'm still not 
totally sure if this is the best visual. But in general, your logs have some kind of life cycle. They, they're, they're generated, they're recorded at some kind of point. Um, they, may, they may be transported somewhere, even if that transport is to local disk. You might do some search and analysis on them, whether that's through like, good log management tooling or simply with grep. Um, you might need to archive them later for compliance reasons. You, you may not ever need to grep over three years' worth of logs, but there's a law that says you just have to have them somewhere in some case of some, some kind of litigation or whatnot. And then eventually that, that, that retention need expires and you can delete that data. So in general, your, your applications, your devices will do the recording, you can transport them uh, to a local disk or to a central facility um, like Greylog or Logstash. Um, I think that about covers it. Uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, this section here is your business, right? You may have lots of applications, lots of devices, lots of systems. Everything from transport through delete, that's what Greylog and Logstash will help you do. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, the the transport part. So I could I think I could fill a, a, a whole talk about well not a whole maybe thirty minutes um, about um, about the transport part because it seems easy. It's like well there's a network and then I just send over the logs. That's a socket. Shouldn't be too hard. Uh, but you have to think about from where the logs are coming and what what the actual transport of the log means for the log source. Um, if you're if you're if you're parsing some log files with Logstash for example. Um, that's not such a big problem, I would say. But if you're, uh, if you're uh, sending from within your application directly, so you're having, I don't know, Ruby on Rails application, a Java application, a PHP application, and you, you, you're generating all kinds of logs in the application, you know, like log.error and then some string and an exception, for example. Um, you, it's, it's nice to send that directly from the application, and that's what I would say you should, you should always do, just to, just to get around the step of parsing that again. Um, and because you have the structured information at that point in time already, so you can include a user ID, a remote IP address, all the kind of stuff, you can include that structure in the log that you're sending over. Um, so that's no problem. You have like log4j appenders, you can use GELF, for example, to send that over, not a problem. But if you're sending that from within your application, you can run into all kinds of problems. If you're, for example, thinking, I don't want to use a log, I don't want to lose any logs that I'm sending, so I'm not going to use UDP, so I'm going to use TCP. And that works fine until you run into slow connection for the first time. And if you are not sending that asynchronously, but like in the actual application flow, then your application will wait for the log to be delivered. Um, you have to care about slow connections, about failing connections, all kinds of stuff. So then you can use UDP, but then you might be then you might be using uh, losing logs. Uh, and still, UDP people like to think like that's that's not, not never going to be a problem. It's always fire and forget. So maybe I lose it, but it's never going to affect my application. Problem is if you're using a host name in there, then the host name uh, resolution may fail and cause all kinds of problems. That's something that we've also seen. And um, I always like to tell this 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 story from a job I was working in before, which I will not further disclose. Um, now, we were using a lot of AMQP to, to uh, transport logs, so applications were writing to an AMQP bus um, and then to a central log management system. Um, and we also had um, a little script that you could use to subscribe to the logs on the production bus. So on your developer uh, MacBook, you could just execute the script, and then you would get the live production logs if you were in the, in the local network. That usually worked quite good. You could use grab, all the kinds of stuff, and live, live debug your own requests if you want to debug something on, on production. Um, until one of the developers was working from home via VPN, um, and then went to lunch and closed the lid of his MacBook, and that caused severe problems on production um, because the connection to the broker was not fully closed and the queue started flowing up just because somebody went to lunch, basically. Um, so it's, you have to, this is, I would say it's, if you're having a good product that does everything from search and analyze to archive and delete, you should care a lot about the transport part. You can really, really do things wrong there. It's not as easy as you would think in the beginning. If you can go with UDP, go with UDP, that's good. Um, but if you need transport security, some stuff like writing to Redis or, or MQP brokers or stuff, really take care that this is never interrupting your actual application in production. Sources of logs. There are also, of course, different sources of logs. 
for example, vendor hardware. This is the sources of logs I hate. Um, because they are terrible. <laughs> They're just awful. <laughs> um, because um, once we got the first customers, like real customers, not users for Greylock 2, but customers, um, they come up with like the craziest log formats that look like syslog, but are not syslog at all. And they're called syslog by the vendor. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for example, um, uh, Cisco, for example, likes to do that. They have like crazy, crazy, crazy uh, uh, syslog formats. And they say, this is syslog, so you can send that to a syslog daemon, and people say, mm, well, Greylock 2 or Logstage is a syslog daemon, that should be working. And then it's not working because it's not syslog. Um, and you have no influence at all. And you can also not install Greylock 2, uh, you can also not install Logstage to fix the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the format that is wrong. So you have to live with the format that's coming out there. So you can send that to a log stash somewhere in between and then forward that to Greylock 2 if you want. Um, but that causes all kinds of problems. And I think, didn't you even drop like the syslog support and send, like we're treating that as plain text only? So our, our, our intention was to get rid of <laughs> the syslog input because whenever, when some, whenever someone, especially a vendor says we use syslog, what they really mean is like the developers did this and just kick it off over the wire, over the network, <laughs> and like, yeah, it's syslog. <laughs> And it's, it's whatever someone wanted to invent at the time. <laughs> so it, it's all, all of the bugs against the syslog support in Logstash are, yeah. you know, I'm sending this from some weird vendor's device, and it says it's syslog, and Logstash says it's not. Like, where, what's going on? And yeah. so it's, yeah. I don't know. And they also like to differ from device to device. So if you say, like, hey, we're supporting Cisco syslog, not you're not actually mm. because they have it's it's horrible it's a mess um and you have no way to influence that and you just have to live with that what we tried by the way um i also thought about like dropping the support completely and just using plain text inputs in our extractors um and then we tried to so we thought it should be possible to write a parser that can parse all those different syslog dialects and we like we spent two weeks and we failed spectacularly it wasn't parsing anything in the end then there's vendor software, for example, Nginx, WordPress, Jira, all kinds of stuff. That's usually better because um, most of them are either running on your own machine and are writing to some log file, and then you can use stuff like Logstash, for example, to parse that into a proper format. Um, and also, most of them tend to have a proper logging format already, except MySQL, maybe. Oh. <laughs> MySQL has like six log formats. I don't know if you're aware, and they're all different. <laughs> it's a nightmare. But the nice, the nice property about this, of the, about this, especially the open source ones, is you'll have at least access to something you can configure, you can control a little bit about how the format that they output. It could be that they have a structured output that you they can support. Jira, most of the, most of their software is Java based, and I'm pretty sure they use Log4j. Log4j is very wonderfully configurable. So you, as an operator of this software, can say, here is where I want the logs. This is the format I want the logs in, instead of just having to accept whatever the vendor is lying to you and saying syslog. <laughs> and then there's in-house software, of course. That's, that's what I meant, like sending from your own applications. Um, they have full control. That's my favorite, of course, because you can use some structured log format, put everything as you need it, send it to your logging system directly. It's all fine. No, like, no hassle with parsing that again somewhere. Yep. Usually, uh, I've also seen like crazy formats coming out of in-house software that was then developed by some other company and they had no access to the source code and then we had to use Logstash again. That's also happening. Can't get away from it. <laughs> yeah, solutions for um, log management. I happen to have two suggestions there. <laughs> <laughs> Where's oh, your logo? The logo's gone. What Wait, happened? No, no, no. It's two slides. Wait. Oh yeah, but Whoa. Oh, sorry. What was that? Whoa. <laughs> they they give me transitions. I can't not use them. It it says flame. I have to use it. I want flames too. Yours didn't burst into flames. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, do you want to say something about Logstash? Again. Uh, well, I'll be talking about this in approximately 20 minutes, yeah. so there's not too much I want to say uh, here, but the, the general summary is that all of the problems that we've talked about and in, in in when we talk about them, we make fun of them because we've been dealing with it for so long it's it's not just pain it's it's become pain that turns into humor or comedy um so when a, when a vendor says oh yeah we use syslog and we look at it and we're like <laughs> you know um it's uh both projects four years old approximately 
solving similar but different problems. You can use them together. We'll talk about how they can do that uh, s later today. Hmm? Um, I think Leonard and I will have different approaches about how they can integrate. Um, but yeah, so with respect to the, the log life cycle with um, the transportation, with search and analytics, with retention, all of these things, both of these tools will help you solve. Uh, and they're both open source. They're both, you're, is Apache 2 still? Yes? Apache the license? Is, Apache 2? is it GPL or Apache uh, 2? GPL. Okay, GPL. so Greylog is GPL, Apache, Logstash is Apache 2, both very friendly open source uh, licenses, both very friendly open source communities. Um, I'll mention this again in my talk, but uh, the, the, the number one feature of being an open source project is having an open and inviting community. If you're rejecting people because you're not understanding them or you're not appreciating the way that they're filing tickets or submitting patches, then you're not, you're failing as an open source project. And from what I've seen, both projects are very, very open and, and welcoming to both new contributors and new users. Right. Um, yeah, Greylock 2, I'm going to say more about Greylock 2. Today, um, there's one important thing, and that is that we have this new version out which changed everything, basically. So if you have been running one of our older versions, you may be interested in looking at that talk later today, um, because I'm going to show the new version. And the new version was the first version that was, I would say, professionally developed by Torch, which is a company I founded behind Greylock 2. And um, we changed basically everything there, and it feels like a complete new product, I would say. So maybe, still sorry? Still log management. Yeah, it's still log management. Still log management. <laughs> it's not that different. But the party gorilla is gone. So we always oh. had this party gorilla logo and people want it back, but there is a, I would say, a copyright issue with the party gorilla. So we yeah. if we ha we'd have to get a new one, I would say. So we'll see. It's okay, the party gorilla lasted for a long time. <laughs> I think the other thing we could say about, about these was why they are open source projects and the, the, the driving force behind them continues to be open source, is yeah. that there are now commercial companies behind it, Torch behind Greylog and Elasticsearch behind Logstash. So if you do find that you, you, you deploy one or both and you like them, but you don't have the time or the energy to make it as successful as you'd need to, then there are resources available to you uh, through either company to um, get support on their respective products. Right, and I think that maybe as a last sentence, there are, of course, a lot of non-open source and commercial solutions out there. It's, it's great to see how Logstash and Greylock2 both sneak their way in like from the bottom into pretty big corporations nowadays because it's open source, engineers like to play around with it, they can just download it, they spin up a new VM, install stuff there, uh, play around with that and then the, the team gets excited and then they are convincing their manager. And it's like, it, you can see that people like to work with both tools because with other tools, it's often the other way around that a manager buys that and says, like, we have this new log management tool, you have to use that now because we bought a license for shitloads of money already. Um, and that's really nice to see. And it's nice to see how the, how the whole market basically changed in the last four years, like, bit by accident, I would say. But it's, that's interesting to see. That's really cool. And I think that, that's it. That's it. We have five minutes before we go to a break. Yeah. So if you've got questions. Did you miss the greatest? <laughs> Uh -huh. this, this mic was really for you. Yeah, perfect. Uh, didn't you miss uh, the greatest joy of Logstash and Greylog? I don't know, but Logstash, I know uh, that you get context and you get connections in your log. So if you mm -hmm. see the MySQL log and you see the Apache mm -hmm. log and they both tell you something, then you say, yeah, now I know mm -hmm. that uh, there is a connection. And yeah. prior to grab or with grab and AVK, you can do it on two files. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we mentioned that uh, there's, there's a couple of different problems with respect to the structure and the format of logging. Uh, structured logging is easier to query. You can say, show me all of the, uh, the requests that, had, that failed, or show me the, all of the database queries that took longer than 100 milliseconds. Those types of queries you cannot do with grep, right? You, you, can, you can try and grep for a number greater than 100, and it's not going to work very well. Um, where was I going with that? And, and the other part of your question was with, with respect to different applications having their, their logs queryable from the same interface. And so you can use a tool like Logstash, for example, to take Apache latency, database latency, a front end application latency, have that all on the same page and, and look at, oh, the database, the application was slow because the database was having a problem. These kinds of contexts uh, uh, will, will get you quicker, quicker insight into understanding what's going on with your systems. Yeah, that's always like the first aha effect. If you're coming into a company that has no log management at all, they're like, wait, wait, what do we need that for? It works great with Grab. Um, because usually those companies are doing 
they know what they are searching for already. They have like an exception code or a user ID or something. They just need to find the log file and they use grep, they get the error message. But the first time they have a problem on production and they go into that system and they, they look at two charts and they see like, oh, we did a release here. And then our application response time went, uh, went completely crazy. And in the same time, our database table scans also went completely crazy, for example. Then, well, well maybe somebody forgot to, to, uh, to, to create an index on some, some, uh, some database table there. And this is like when, when people get this aha moment uh, really quickly, after, because that yep. happens all the time in production. And you don't yes. have to wait long for, for seeing why you want to have log management. Yeah. yeah. When you can put uh, metrics on the same visual as human activity on your operators from your system, you can say, we did a deploy and latency went to hell. Yeah. Like, th those are the kinds of things you can get. Grep will never, ever tell you. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about that. There are, there are more things in log management that I think are a bit too deep for this half hour that we had today. It's like, for example, alerting, like proactively alerting based on values from your logs, for example, yep. stuff like that. That's also something. I mean, you could try to do that with Grab, but <laughs> you'll have to see how good that works. You have the distributed problem yeah. again. Do we have any other questions? I think we have a minute, one more minute. I don't think so. No questions. Nobody? Excellent. So we answered good. all of your questions. <laughs> uh, so before we go to a uh, quick break, um, after this talk, is I, I will be presenting on Logstash's approach to this particular problem, and then later at four. I think it's at today, four. I think it's at four. Yeah. Uh, Leonard will be talking about Greylog. Thank you. Thank you.